welcome again to our program, Revelation of the Coming King. I don't know, I'm becoming more and more excited than you can see in my presentations. I am, I am now on fire because this is the, the section is telling, is telling me about the time in which I live now and all we live and, and what is really waiting for us. But it's not simply about the future. It's about telling us how today we have to come much closer in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, I'm Ranko Stefanovic, professor of the New Testament at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Se uh, Seminary, Andrews University. And what we are doing here is a part of that long series uh, titled Revelation of the Coming King. So we are trying to cover all 22 chapters of the book of, Re of Revelation um, in this series. So if you have missed some of those pr of the programs presented, you still have a chance to catch it up, huh? We would like um, uh, to remind you once again that it is impossible to cover everything what is in the book of Revelation in, in these hours. But we would like to encourage you once these programs are over that you take and to study the word of God for yourself. You can do it in much, much a deeper way, uh, but you need some tools the best tool recommended to all of you, I'm holding just in my hand, is the Bible. The Bible is infallible commentary on the book of Revelation. If you follow the instructions of the Bible and you go to the Bible to find for the key of those difficult symbolic uh, expressions in the book of Revelation, you cannot be far away from the meaning of the, of, of the text. Okay, but you need evidently some other tools. And for this occasion, I just want to recommend one. It's actually written by me. It took several years of my life to produce this volume, and uh, which is titled Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a verse by verse commentary on the book of Revelation. The purpose of this commentary is not really to give us explanation of everything that is in the book of Revelation, even though it covers all verses of the book of Revelation. But the purpose is really to give you the insight into those Old Testament and other backgrounds. So to help you to understand the symbolic language of the book of Revelation is. That's why you need many other books, because no book written on the book of Revelation covers everything what is, what is in, this, in this book. As you know, every time we are giving you the pages. So once this program is over, you can go open these pages and then you can study for yourself. And I'd like to remind you that today, um, uh, if you want to find the material discovered today, is from page 463. <laughs> Let me see how far we will be able to go, okay? It's from page 463 of this commentary titled Revelation of Jesus Christ. But let me remind you once again all these tools are good, but there is something that is most important is that we always ask God for guidance. It is only the Holy Spirit who is able really to help us to make sense of these difficult passages of the book of Revelation. And this is exactly what we would like to do at this moment. Our Heavenly Father, I'm asking you humbly, with sincerity of my heart, that you come here and be with us and with our viewers and to help us that we can understand these messages of the book of Revelation. Father, please be with us and give us your Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit teach us into all the truth. And we pray all of this in the precious name of the one who died on the cross of Calvary, the one who is the main subject of the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We pray all of this in his precious name, amen. amen. Okay, I would like to invite you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. We are, we are, still, we are still there. Okay. At the end, do you remember last time we talked what God will be doing at the time of the preparation for the battle of Armageddon for that final crisis? You see, friends, God will not leave any person uninformed. There are two things that make us to think here. Number one, God does not want to leave any person uninformed. But there is a second point is, if God does not want to leave any person uninformed, 
it means no person will have an excuse. It's a great responsibility on, on, on us. You see, the purpose of three, these three angel messages, Revelation chapter 14, um, 6 to 11, it's really to tell people what will happen in the future and about the consequences of their choice, whether positive or, or, or negative. But the three angel messages, they conclude with something that is very significant. It's in verse 12. Boy, this is always a constant feature of the book of Revelation. Whenever we talk about what people will be doing and choice that people will be made, uh, making, and, and, and that the majority of the people will make that wrong choice, the book of Revelation always turns to positive, telling us, but be careful, if you make that choice for God, you are not alone, because God will have many of his people those times. Amen. They're called by different names, 144,000, the remnant. The, the worshipers of God, the followers of the Lamb. But here, there is, for the first time, the expression that is used. Here, verse 12, chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. How are God's people here referred to as the saints? You see, the word saint does not refer to the person who is sinless. We have even the major Christian church who has, that has the saints. But they recognize that those saints are not while they are alive. They become saints only when they die. Of course, then everybody is a saint. Because people cannot sin any longer. But see, the word saint here is applied to God's people who are alive who will live at the time of the end. And the word saint is not the people who are really completely sinless. The Greek word hagioi, hagios, actually it means to be separated. It means those people are not the part of the world. They do not have a share, okay, of uh, uh, decisions of the majority of the world who will side with, with the beast because they follow the lamb. And they, they have their characteristics. One more time, the book of Revelation is reminding us, what are their characteristics? The same that are found in Revelation 12, 17. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. They're so loyal to Jesus, they cannot even imagine to betray him Amen. with any, any wrong, wrong decision. Praise God, I want really to be part of that group called the saints of Amen. Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. If this is your decision, today you are making great decision. Keep in mind, they do not become saints in the final, final events. They have to become saints before the final events come. This is what helped them in their loyalty to Christ. And now it says there is a contrast. And this is the future of those saints. Boy, this is very special for me. And I heard the voice from heaven saying, Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Actually, what we have here, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, it's one of the seven blessings of the book of Revelation. Starting with chapter 1, verse 3, we have seven blessings. They have chiastic structure. They're fantastically organized. So this is one of those seven blessings. Yes. Okay. Why this warning? Why this blessing promised to those who die in the Lord? Do you remember in the Revelation chapter 13 that the beast is threatening to the people that whoever does not receive the mark of the beast, that person should be killed, persecuted, yes. Friends, this is a great challenge to every person in this world. But you see, what God is telling his people, if you have even to die for God, you are blessed from now, from, from now, now on. You see, when God calls people to serve him, you remember in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he said, be faithful to God until the point of death, mm -hmm. and you will receive the Stephanos, <laughs> the crown 
the crown of, of, of life. Amen. Yeah? We have to be reminded that loyalty to God is to the point of death. But sometimes it's much more difficult to live for God and then to die for Christ. Mm -hmm. So this promise involves all those who will even have to give their lives for the gospel and those who remain alive. But look something else in this text. It says, yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labor, for their deeds follow with them. I don't know, it, it, at first glance, this text does not um, sound anything in particular. But if you go to the third angel message, you will notice in verse 11 that says that all those who receive the mark of the beast, they do not have a rest and a night. A rest day and night. Do you, do you see that? They don't have, never rest. But what about God's people? A God's people, when they, if they remain faithful to God, they will always have the rest. By the way, the, the word rest is particularly significant here because when we go to the book of Hebrews chapter four, verses nine to 11 there, we read that there is one rest that is promised to God's people of which the Sabbath is the foretaste and foreshadow. You see, friends, people, because of the fear of the future, because of the fear for their existence, they will succumb to the temptations and what will happen in the final, in the final crisis, hoping to find the rest. This is actually what Babylon promises to the people. But according to the book of Revelation, the true rest is found only if we side with God, if we obey God, and if we serve and worship God. The true rest is found only only with God. There is no rest. According to the book of Isaiah, there is no rest uh, to, the, to, the, to the wicked. Oh boy, this is a great, great call to every human being to really come closer to God and to build his or her future with God. Now, I would like to ask you one question is, this is what three angel messages are all about. And the choice, do you want to rest? or you hope to find the rest in something that does not offer the rest. Actually, to that concept of rest, the human institution and human day of worship is related in contrast to God's day of rest that really give us the taste, foretaste and foreshadow of that eternal rest that we'll receive. But as, a, as that eternal gospel is being preached, now you have to help me, how many groups of the people are in the world? Actually, three groups. Let me explain. One group of the people who are with God, they're sealed and going through the process of sealing. They're so faithful to God, they're so loyal to God, they follow the Lamb wherever the Lamb goes. That's on one side. On the opposite side are the worshipers of the beast and the followers of the beast. They, they have the mark of the beast on themselves as a sign of their loyalty to that human institution and the human system. Two groups, but there is a third group. And which group is that? Those who belong either there or there. They're neutral. They, they may even call themselves to be Christian. And they say, I sometimes even go to the church three times in my life when I was born when I got married, mm -hmm. and the third time they will take me there when I die. Mm -hmm. They call themselves Christian. They said sometimes they give a few dollars there, there to the church. But they say, you see, I belong neither to God nor to Satan. Maybe one day I will make my decisions for God. Mm -hmm. See, they're neutral. They don't belong to any of those groups. You see, friends, the efforts of Satan and the effort of God is not directed toward that group or that group because that group made already a decision for God or another group. God is still trying to reach them. The, but the main target of those three angel messages is that group that comes between. God is trying to reach the human beings 
to tell them about the decision that they have to make and the consequences of their own decisions. Not because of the threat, because God loves them. In the same time, time as the parents say to the children, hey, you're making this decision, these are the consequences. Parents are not doing that because they hate their children, but because they love them and they want to prevent them to make a wrong decision. Are you still with me? Amen. But once the proclamation of the everlasting gospel is done, and when every human being is confronted with what the decision to make, every human being finally will side either for God or against God. There is the conclusion of the proclamation, and there is the conclusion of the time that God allowed, allotted to the human beings to make that decision. And when the uh, uh, preaching of the everlasting go gospel is concluded, now there are only two groups. Mm -hmm. And those two groups are actually presented in this section of the book of Revelation. Friends, one more time, the book of Revelation is fantastically organized. Because people so many times uh, uh, s read superficially, they don't see what is there, and they think that the book of Revelation is not organized. Please, these verses, they do not talk about the second coming of Christ. Actually, these verses uses, use the, uh, um, the Old Testament image to tell us about something. It's about two camps, about two groups of people in the final events at the conclusion of the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And they are portrayed in terms of the two harvests. Okay, let's read quickly what we have here. Verse 14, then I looked and behold a white cloud and one sitting on the cloud was like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was a reap. What do we have here? We have that end time harvest. If you really want to understand what we have here, um, we have to read this text through the glasses of the parable that Jesus made. And actually, we are very lucky that Jesus also provided the interpretation of that, of that parable. If you, if you remember about that bad and good seed when, when that person put it there in the ground, it's in Matthew chapter 13, verses uh, 39 and 41, when Jesus really talks about the end of the world in terms of the great harvest of all those who ex uh, um, uh, have taken God to be the first and the last in their lives, those who have sided with God, they are the wheat harvest, okay? And they will be put there in the, in the storehouses there, oh God. But all those who rejected God from their lives, they will be put there, okay, on that other place, ready, ready for the destruction. So, so we, we have really the, uh, the two texts that they parallel, parallel each other. So this is not about the second coming of Christ, or better to say, yeah, it's the second coming of Christ, but not the very arrival of Jesus down to the earth. All the preparations are now made. Okay, the, the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is concluded. Now Jesus is ready to come, but before Jesus, Jesus comes, it has to be made a decision, which is actually the proclamation of that pre-advent judgment that has to, um, to take place prior to the second coming of Christ. So we are talking here about the righteous. You see, the, we have the harvest of the righteous. Okay, as a result of the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, those people who have accepted the gospel message and they have sided with God. However, there is another group that is mentioned here in this, in this text. It says, verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has a power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the wine, from the vine of the earth, 
because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now there is another harvest. But this is the great harvest, grape harvest. Of whom? All those who rejected God. Those who, who, made, who made that wrong decision, willingly and knowingly, they made a wrong decision. Yes. You see, they are also gathered, but for what purpose? You see, the first group is put there in the storehouse. They're ready for the kingdom. But the second group is put there to experience the consequences of, of, of that, 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 that decision. By the way, the language that we have here is sometimes confusing us. Yes. But it's taken from the Old Testament. It's taken from, for instance, the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, 1 to 6. We will not read this text. I would like to invite all of you that you read this text for yourself. The text talks about God who is coming, trampling, okay, in the wine press over the enemies of his people who make them suffer and who, who try to destroy, to destroy God, God's people. But there's also another text in the book of Joel, and please allow me, I would like to turn to this text. It's Joel chapter 2. I have to just to decide which text to read, there are, there are too many. But, but just that you see how the book of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. The book of Joel chapter 3, we read, we read verses 2 and 3. Let's read from verse 1. For behold, in those days, at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Now let's read verse 13. It says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. You can see. And there are many, many other texts that you can find in my commentary when you, when you study for yourself there. That you see how this imagery is taken actually uh, from the, from the, from the old, old Testament. Okay. Without spending too much time here on this text, you will ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of this, of this section? Is Actually, this is the introduction to what follows. Have you ever thought in what section of the book of Revelation is the shredding or trampling of the grapes in the press is described there in the book of Revelation? No, actually the seven last plagues. What you have here is the introduction. And actually, this vision is further elaborated here in chapter, chapter 15. I would like you to turn to chapter 15 so that you, that you see what we, what, we, what we have here. You will see that actually chapter 15, let's let me put this text here, chapter 15, okay, it's repetition of chapter 14, verses 14 to 20, but they put in different way. Here is a high symbolic language. Are you still with me? Here is the high symbolic language taken from the Old Testament and actually the parables of Jesus, okay? The two harvests. But here now it's, it's described in a very practical term about this harvest, wheat harvest, and the grape harvest. Let's, let's read in Revelation 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Now, uh, the book of Revelation begins a new section. It's telling us that as the preaching of the gospel is concluded, 
Those people who made the decision knowingly and willingly, please, I'm repeating this constantly, knowingly and willingly, they sided with Satan. They turned their back completely to God. God wants now to show them the consequences of their decision. Not that God enjoys in indulging himself in punishing people, simply to show them the consequences of their decision is. So, this, uh, uh, consequences of the decision is portrayed as the trampling okay, of, the, of the grapes in the press. Here in Revelation 15, they are mentioned as the seven last plagues. But you will notice here something in the text. It says the seven last plagues are the last. Why the last? I'm sorry, friends. As we are taping this, this, this series, if some of you comes and I say, you are the last, what does it mean? That somebody came before you. You cannot be the last if you are the only one. Something to be last, something has to come before that last one. If these plagues are the last, what does it mean? The plagues that were before them. And these are the plagues of the seven trumpets. Unfortunately, there are some Christians who call themselves futurists who are advocating the idea that the seven last plagues and the seven trumpets are one and the same thing. Mm. We already dealt with that concept, if you remember, at the beginning of this series. And sometimes the language is confusing because the language of the seven trumpets and the language of the seven last plagues is very, very, mar m very much similar. But you remember the difference? That the seven trumpets, okay, they hit the rebellious humanity during the time as intercession was going there in heavenly places. They were need, not simply punitive. They were for the purpose to open the eyes of people and to bring them back, back to God. So the seven trumpets are taking place as the gospel is being preached, as the intercession of Jesus in the heavenly places is taking place. Are you still with me? And they were very, very partial in their effect. Okay? They were intended to save people, to bring closer to God. However, if we come to seven last plagues, even though the language is very, very, very similar, keep in mind the seven last plagues are the last. The seven trumpets are never the last plagues. <laughs> They're never referred to as the last in the book of Revelation. One more time. When historically and timely, where do the seven last plagues take place? After the conclusion of the preaching of the gospel, are you still with me? After the conclusion of the, of the, of the preaching of the, of the gospel, the decision is made. Keep in mind, we have something to mention very important. The seven last plagues are not intended to bring anybody to God. Because the mercy is concluded. Intercession is done. People have made their decisions. A decision who is for the kingdom and who will be left out is already made. By the way, if you go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 8, we read that there is something that is very significant and very important for the understanding of the seven last plagues. And it reads there, and the temple was filled with smoke. Keep in mind that the angels that are bestowing the, 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 the place are coming from the temple. It says, and the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Friends, this is very important text telling us about the time the timing of the seven last plagues. Keep in mind, it says, that before the plagues hit the rebellious humanity, what happens there in heaven? That the temple of God, that you remember we talk about the temple that is there, there in heavenly places, is filled with smoke, so nobody could enter. Well, I, ju I just want to show to you one more time how Old Testament is important for the understanding of the book of Revelation. The two texts, Okay, the first text is in Exodus chapter 40, 
34 and 35. I will not read this text. Because there is another text that it's almost identical, which is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10, 11. The first text talks about the tabernacle, the tent, the sanctuary that was built by Moses in wilderness. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 11, we have about the temple built by Solomon. You see, when the building of the tent and the building of the temple was concluded, the same happened. That's the reason we are reading only one text. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. It says, it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is what happened when the temple of Solomon was built. Now, please, you have now to help me something. What does it mean? That the temple was filled with the smoke of the glory of God and the priest could not enter, enter the temple. What happens when the priests are not in the temple? There is no intercession. Are you still with me? There is no intercession. You, we have to understand the significance of this phrase from the Old Testament. So let's go back to Revelation 15, 8. The fact that seven last plagues are poured out on the rebellious humanity. After the temple was filled with the smoke of the glory of God and for his power, no one was able to enter the temple until the plagues are poured out. What does it mean? It means that the seven last plagues, they happen as the intercession of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places is concluded. You see, people don't have a chance any longer to make the decision for God. By the way, in order to avoid any misunderstanding, whether by you or by the viewers, they say, so God is not giving them any chance. You will see that, that even the seven last plagues will not turn people to God, even to show any desire <laughs> to change the decision that they, that, that they, they make. The seven last plagues do not bring anybody to God, simply show what is in the human heart, that those people who made their decisions against God. They did it knowingly and willingly. And there is nothing in this, there is nothing in this world that can, change, that can change their hearts. This is, friends, this is the main purpose of this text to tell us. Now there is a question then. What is the purpose of the seven last plagues? This is what we want now to understand. Because we will not go and try to understand every plague, because you can study for yourself. We want to understand the purpose and intention of these plagues. As you read in chapter 15 from verse 2 to 5, one more time 144,000 is mentioned. By the way, they are not here mentioned, um, referred to as 144,000, but you will notice it's the same group. Where are they? Where are they? They said in verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, please, what does sin, what, 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 what picture does come to your mind as we are reading this? By the way, the seven last plagues are built on the scene of the Egyptian plagues. And you remember after the plagues what happened, the people of Israel left the Egypt. <laughs> they came there to the sea. You remember after the destruction of the Egyptians. And we have a Miriam was leading the whole choir of the people of Israel singing the song of Moses. By taking this image of Israel coming out of Egypt, Exodus of Israel from Egypt. Now the book of Revelation portrays God's people at the time of the seven last plagues. They're victorious. You see, Egyptians were killed, but Israelites were spared. So here is the seven last plagues are hitting the rebellious humanity. What about God's people? Do you remember the wheat harvest? 
they're secured there in the storehouses of God. The seven last plagues will not harm them, even though God's people will in certain measure experience the consequences of the seven last plagues. Keep in mind, they still live on the earth. But in Revelation 7, they said, they will not hunger any longer. They will not thirst any longer. The sun will not scorch them. Why? Because these are all the consequences of the seven last plagues. God's people somehow will have share and experience, but the seven last plagues will not harm them as they will harm the rebellious humanity. So they are spared. Okay. So now the text goes on in chapter 16. Keep in mind, we are now going to chapter 16. Now we have the treading, trampling of the grapes in the press there. Okay? He says, verse 16, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple. You see, it comes from the temple. Saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. I'd like here to address one issue is, you see, the temple is here the key concept. Everything comes from the temple of God. It's in the temple the decision is made who is for the kingdom and who is not. And I know I meet my fellow Christians somewhere and are familiar with the statement that during the time, God's people will live without the intercessor. Keep in mind the clause of the probation is, there is no intercession there in the heavenly places. And some of those people, they, they, they are so much afraid. They're asking themselves, boy, who will be able to stand at that, at, on that day? How will be able to live without intercessor? Friends, yes, during those times, God's people will live without intercessor because there is no intercession in the heavenly places. But we don't have any statement in the entire Bible that during that time, God's people will live without Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Savior will be with us. He promised to us, I will be with you always until the very end of the age. That's why 144,000, they follow the Lamb wherever the Lamb goes. Nobody and nothing will separate God's people from their Savior. Amen. But we will not have the intercessor because our eternal destiny is decided prior to that. Okay? Yes. So now we are coming to seven last plagues. I hope that you have the text there in front of yourself. I don't have a, a time now to go and, and, and to read all these texts. But let me just go briefly and summarize to what we have here in the first 10 verses of the book of Revelation. You will notice it talks about the first angel and the first plagues actually um, um, uh, causes, it says, sore on the people, terrible sores of those who have a mark of the beast who worship his image. Then it's going to the, to the, to the second angel and, and hits the sea and the blood uh, that many people died there. Then you have the third plague. I'm talking about the rivers and springs of waters that become a blood. And there is voice, hey, they cause the blood, they persecute God's people. Now, God, you are just because you have given them to drink the blood. I believe as we are reading these verses that the Egyptian plagues <laughs> suddenly come to, 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 to your mind, okay? Then we have a, a, a verse 7. Boy, I'm so tempted how much I can go to the text. It says, and I heard the altar saying, can you, are you with me? Then I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgment. Please, why is this text so much significant? That the voice is coming from the altar telling that the justice is done. Do you remember what we read in the scene of the, of the fifth seal? That there from the altar, the blood of the martyrs, of God's people who were suffering because of the gospel, they're looking for justice. Now from the same altar, the voice is coming, stating that the justice is done. Amen. And we have finally that the prayers of God's people are answered. Friends, sometimes we wonder if our prayers are ever heard by God. Yes, they are. But God does everything his own time. Sometimes we have to wait for a long time for a justice. 
But believe me, justice is with God. We simply have to wait for him. And we come to verse 8 and says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. Please allow me now that I will stop here with verse 9 and we will continue on. A great debate exists among Christians. Trying to answer the question, are the seven last plagues literal or symbolic? Keep in mind that the book of Revelation is written in symbolic language. And we saw, even though the seven trumpets, that this, that's description is very close to the description of seven last plagues. But we saw clearly in the light of the Old Testament background that the plagues of the seven trumpets are clearly symbolic. But friends, this is one of the most difficult questions that we have one of several different questions on the book of Revelation. Let me tell you why. Because when you read about the first four plagues, any symbolic meaning doesn't make sense. This is recognized almost, almost by all commentators. Everybody who has invested some time in studying this subject, there is only one conclusion. They must be literal. Please, please, please now. You have to be now with me. Now we'll ask the question, why, why do you rely on what people think? No, that's not the point. I just want to tell you, everybody who is confronted with this question reaches the conclusion, why? When we go to Revelation chapter 7, you remember we talk about 144,000 who have come out of the great tribulation of the seven last plagues. One more time, 144,000 who have come out of the great tribulation the seven last plagues. They're given the promise. The sun will not scourge them any longer. They will not be hungry and thirsty on, on the longer. Any plague will not harm them any longer, which points to literal, not to symbolic. That sun, that hunger, then thirst, you see that? Is the hunger, thirst, and the sun in the place of the seven last plagues? Because the water will be, be, become the blood. So it's clearly, I don't have any doubt, <coughs> that the first four of the seven plagues must be understood literally, okay? About something that happens in the nature that will make people suffer. However, when you come to the fifth plague, then sixth plague and the seven, then literal meaning does not make sense. Are you, are you with me? Let's go, let's go to the fifth plague. It's verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Is throne of the beast something literal? Okay. And his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of a pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They did not repent from their deeds. Then if you go from verse 12, 6, talks about um, river Euphrates. He talks about the bees, a false prophet, and the dragon, and three demons coming about them. And the battle of Armageddon, you can see that, that all these things must be understood symbolically, interpreted symbolically. So at the present time, I have to say it with all humility, okay, and the fear of God. Our best understanding that we have today and we are departing from the principle that we have established, that the fourth four, four plague are disasters in the nature. <coughs> it's description of something that will literally happen. However, when we come to the fifth plague, sixth and the seventh plague, the literal meaning does not make sense. It must be understood symbolically. Are you with me? This is our best way, and please, we still have to leave the room, maybe for corrections in the future, okay? But this is our best way, and Revelation chapter 7, 
the last three verses of, of chapter 7, they really are telling us clearly that the first four plagues are literal. Okay, are we still friends and at home? Okay, okay. Now, you have now to be here with me. What is the purpose of the seven last plagues? We already stated. It's not to bring anybody to conversion. Keep in mind, what is that that the beast and the counterfeit trinity in general, Babylon, end time Babylon, what is that they promise to the people if they side with their system and they receive the mark of the beast? They're promising to them a bright future, happiness. All the problems in this world will be happy. And, and I just want to tell our viewers, today we have a many um, streams and groups of Christians who are co hoping that one day, if one universal religious system is established, if all the people worship and believe God in the same way, on the same day, <laughs> and everybody sides in the systems, that all problems in America will be solved, and all the problems will be solved, solved in, the, in, the, in, the, in this world. Actually, this is exactly what Babylon is promising to the people. But can you imagine, now you have to be with me, what will happen when people make that decision and that one system is created, people worship God within that system on a particular day with one mindset, and when seven last plagues hits the humanity, what is that that will happen? I'm sorry. I pause here for a moment. You see, suddenly people will become disillusioned. They will ask the question, where are those promises? We have made our decision. We have sided with the system. This is what we are doing, what we are asked to do with that. Now, contrary to our expectations and what was promised to us, now we are suffering. Did you see that? How much people will suffer during the, the seven last plagues? But there is something else. When those people start suffering, what is the first thing that they will do? They will turn to Babylon and, ask, uh, and seek for the answer, asking for the protection. But friends, what is that that is taking place in the, in the fifth plague? Did you notice? What is that that it now takes place in the fifth plague? It's actually the very seat of Babylon, it's a hit by the seven last plagues. Please, please, I, I want one more, I want one more time to make it very cre clear to all of you and to our viewers. Sister Shirley, can I put you here on the spot? Can you imagine you are in a terrible financial situation? I see you, you and your husband that I appreciate so much. This is just illustration, okay? You are in such terrible financial situation, you have to sell your house, and finally to be homeless. And I come to you and I tell you, Sister Shelley, Shelley and Brother David, don't worry. I will give you $100,000 and you will get out of that financial situation and you will be saved. We say, praise God. Then tomorrow you learn out that actually I am in terrible financial situation. That at my home, I don't have even money to buy for my food. How much would your promise mean to you? You say, he cannot help himself. How can he help me? Are you saying, then my promise to you would be completely useless. Am I correct? Yes. Can you imagine yourself when the rebellious humanity, those who sided with the beast, with Babylon, suffer? They turn their eyes toward Babylon, then they see that the fifth plague hits the very Babylon. Let's read one more time. Let's read more one more time, verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. They gnawed their tongues because of a pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Tell me now, how those people who believe Babylon, side of Babylon, how would they feel? Babylon cannot help itself. How can Babylon help us? 
This is the background. This is the key to the understanding of what comes next in the description of the seven last plagues. Please, let's read verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And its river was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Please allow me to stop here for a while. What happens in the sixth plague? Okay, there's some confusing terms. It says that the seven, uh, that the uh, sixth plague actually hits the great river Euphrates. What happens to the river Euphrates? It says that the waters of the river were dried up. For which purpose? So that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Can I now remind you one more time that we are now dealing with the symbolic language of the book of Revelation. So we have to understand what this um, uh, um, uh, symbol actually means here. May I ask you one more time the question, how is the end time, that evil system that will stand in opposition to God, how is called in the book of Revelation? Babylon, okay? Now we have to understand something, something from history. And please, I've come here now to this blackboard. I should have left a little bit the space here, but I will, I will use this part here anyway, okay? We have to go a little bit to history. We have to go to the Old Testament. Because the main power, the main power that stood in opposition to God and God's people in the Old Testament was Satan. But the earthly power that really sent opposition to God that Satan used so much was actually Babylon. Probably you say that this is exaggeration because Babylon is just mentioned later in the Old Testament. No, Babylon for the first time is mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. <laughs> it is from that time on we have constantly in the Old Testament two cities, is Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon is the arch enemy of God's people in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament portrays actually, actually uh, that Babylon and its fall. Okay, so please, Let's, let's put it here. I just want to put it in following way, okay? Um, and this is not just a coincidence because according to Greek historian Herodotus, Babylon was a square. He tells us about something new, Jerusalem, that is square in, in, in Revelation chapter 22 because Babylon, do you remember, is the counterfeit of the city of Jerusalem. But you, see, you know, where is Babylon located? in the desert place. It was located on the territory of ancient Mesopotamia. But see, Babylon as the city by itself would not be able to survive and to stand alone. Babylon owed its existence just to one entity. Do you know the, the name of that entity? It was named Euphrates because it was the river Euphrates that ran through the city. Without the river Euphrates, there would not be Babylon. Actually, Babylon was surrounded by a triple wall here around. And there are also the walls here. And nobody even dared to think that Babylon could ever be, 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 be conquered. Actually, it's because of Euphrates, the king Nebuchadnezzar beautified Babylon to its excellence, to, to, to its excellence. So you have to keep in mind that Babylon owed its existence, very existence, to the river Euphrates. The U uh, river Euphrates actually sustained Babylon, provided the water and that huge vegetation so you could come and surround Babylon for a long time. Nothing would happen 
because of the river Euphrates. River Euphrates provided life to, ba to, to, to Babylon. Now you have to ask me a question. What happens when you read this statement that the river Euphrates dries up? What does it mean? Do you remember that? That Babylon owes its existence to river Euphrates. What happens when the waters of Euphrates dries up? No Euphrates, no Babylon. By the way, keep in mind that this ancient imagery of Babylon, it's used here as the symbol to portray the end time Babylon of the book of Revelation. I would like to suggest to you, we have just, just uh, uh, more than one minute left to make introduction to our following lecture. If you go to Revelation chapter 17, that talks about Babylon. Revelation chapter 17, we read verse 1, okay? It says, the one of the seven angels who had the seven balls came and spoke with me saying, Revelation 17, 1, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. What is the name of this harlot in Revelation 17? It's a Babylon. Where does Babylon sit on? Revelation 17, on many waters. What do those waters symbolize? It's a river Euphrates, many waters. If you go to verse 17, uh, verse 15 of chapter 17, we read, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the tongues. So when we are talking about the end time Babylon, that sits on the river Euphrates on many waters. What do those many waters stand for in the book of Revelation chapter, chapter 17? Okay, I will not give the answer. The answer will be in our next lecture. And I just want to tell you, we have the sure word of prophecy. And I'd like to invite you to join us for next lecture to see how the book of Revelation portrays the future that's before us.